This is The Big City. Located somewhere in the midst of the big city is a park. My local neighborhood park. One not unlike thousands of local parks found in cities all over this country. Imagine for a moment. What if the park could talk? Just think the stories it would tell. I've been fortunate in my life to have lived mostly near a park. I visit quite often, and the more I go and spend time there, I find myself curious. Curious about the park, about the people I see, and what they're doing there. What is it that brings people to a park? Why do they come here? And what significance, if any, does the park have in their lives, or even in the community? And what if the park wasn't here? Would it make a difference? What stories might they have to tell? I wanted to find out, so that's what I did. I set out to discover not how this park came to be, but rather the importance of it being here. Always come to the park. Yeah, to hang out. We're just warming up right now for a game of ultimate yeah. frisbee, like frisbee uh, football. 
Today I'm here at Reading the Paper looking for work. Oh, well, I usually come here to walk my dog, so that's why I came in and walking the dog. My basset hound, Barry. <laughs> Practicing staff. It's a good big place where I can get room where if I throw it or drop it, I don't hurt anybody other than myself. Are you a martial artist? Kind of. Any real martial artist would laugh. We just we light the ends on fire. It makes it a lot more interesting. So it's, it's a little bit of martial arts and a little bit of dance, and anybody with any real martial arts skills would just kick the crap out of me. I come here to get some exercise. I try. I come here just to do some walking. But uh, it turns out that I usually end up doing a lot less than I want to. Just doing a little uh, holiday metal detecting. Had kind of a slow day today with the holiday. A lot of businesses closed, so went out and did some metal detecting. Uh, I've been doing this for about a year at this park, feeding the squirrels and metal detecting. I'm out walking my dogs around. Okay. We try to do at least five times a week, if not every day. We've been coming every Sunday for about a year at 9 o'clock to do Tai Chi. Some of us drop in a little later. <laughs> <laughs> I get here on 9.30, but we still do the whole form. Well, it is a moving meditation. It is from China. It's also a martial art. You learn it very slowly uh, with no momentum, so when, it's, when you actually add a momentum, it becomes a very powerful. The form we're taught is really designed for longevity, and it's just taught for uh, overall wellness. It opens you up, it relaxes you, it grounds you, it's... It's a pretty wonderful thing. Makes me ready for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> when I come to the park, I uh, walk my dog, I pick up the poop. Tranquil. <laughs> it's very tranquil. I like it. Yeah. I dig it a lot. And this park is cool because there's not a lot of like craziness going on and like harassing. It's a nice thing too, like living in a city, it's nice to be able to have a spot where you can go where it feels like you're getting out of the city. So, which I definitely feel that with the size of this park. Mm -hmm. You definitely feel that. And you that. get shade here too, which is nice. I don't know. You know, I'm, in my neighborhood, there's not a lot of trees. So, yeah. it's, it's nice to come here where it's cool. It offers me. A place, I guess, I don't know if it's a solace, but there are a lot of times, you know, that I, I just need to get away, get outside. I moved into my apartment about two blocks away about a year and a half ago, and this park was one of the main reasons why I moved in, because I need space and I need green. Our teacher asked us to really extend our energy, and when you're in a small space, it's hard to imagine that when you're outside, it's a lot easier to imagine expanding kind of gets me away. Sometimes it's just a good way to sort through your day, your thoughts. Oh, there was this little puppy, right? And I was like, let's name him Puppy. So I followed Puppy around, <laughs> and Puppy ran off, you know, through the park, and I followed him, and he found his owners, which were these, like, four Arab men sitting in a little circle in the park, and they were just, like, sniffing coke in the middle of the park, That's... and it was insane. I was like, no! Yeah. So then I was telling him, I was like, no, we have to adopt the puppy. He's being neglected. You see, you see people set up drum sets. I've seen drums over there. I've seen good drummers. I've seen people doing kickbox, and I've seen people do like theater combat or something. They're practicing with swords. I've seen um, just really strange things and shady things too. From you know some of the weekly bum conventions to you know occasional shootouts that happen late at night. Those I haven't witnessed, but you hear it and cop cars flinging through the park late at night. Oh, there's a few homeless people here, uh, but they're pretty nice. I haven't been bothered by anybody. Besides us? <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs>
three-legged dogs, um, Cirque du Soleil performers, birthday clowns. There's pretty much always something going on. Yeah, I saw something strange and ordinary, unusual. I took a pee next to a tree yesterday. Okay. But it's strange and unusual, isn't it? Here in the park? Here in the park. The park offers so much more than just a place to come and visit for open space with trees and grass. As I spent more time here than usual, I found a wide variety of activities, sports, and recreation going on. Things that I hadn't really noticed before that were happening around me. Right here in the park. Basically what my job is, is uh, to plan, program, and organize activities for uh, the community. Uh, that goes for classes and for sports from ages uh, 3 to 90. I'm a rec leader, a rec assistant. Uh, what I do is I, um, I teach kids how to maintain sports and cope with attitudes or when they lose or when they win, uh, things like that. I'm a recreation assistant and I've been at this, uh, working at this park uh, since 1985 and I've been a volunteer coach for more than 30 years. The, the center I, I volunteered at and I eventually got picked up part time by bugging the director constantly. Nine people from that center who were part-timers went on to become directors or supervisors in that capacity. I just kept doing the same thing what I usually do. Uh, you know, after school, I'll come up here and play basketball with some of the guys and stuff like that. And then one day I came back up here and uh, the lady was here that run the center. And she asked me, um, if, was I looking for a job? And I said, yeah, I was looking for a job. I said, yeah. She goes, how would, you know, would you like to be a volunteer being a coach? And I was like, wow, for real? She's like, yeah, you know, working with little kids. And I was like, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm down for it. What happened was I was here so much 
uh, coaching that finally, I guess, they got tired of me <laughs> being here, and they said, hey, why don't we make you a staff person? It was a true story. And they said, why don't you, uh, you, know, why don't, why don't you work here? You can get paid for, your, for some of your work. So I said, sure, why not? So the first thing, of course, I said was, how about retroactive pay? But they didn't, uh, they didn't see that. I enjoy being around young people. I like competition. I'm a big sports guy, and, uh, and I always, there goes a buzzer. And, and um, it's, uh, it's something I've always enjoyed. After stopping and talking to some of the staff here, I was very surprised to discover all of the different activities and programs that are offered here at the Parks, Recreation, and Community Center. I had never made time to stop and really take notice of everything that was going on here before. In my interview with Patrick Cannon, the Recreation Center's director, he made special note and was proud of all the different programs that they have here especially the programs that they offer for small children. We have like preschool classes, we have Tiny Tot Tumbling, we have a Tiny Tot Tennis program, we have basketball, we have, we, we're pretty much hitting that early age, introduce it to them. Not so much to be so competitive, but just so they know what's going on. So they come nine years old, they're, they're basically a veteran. And um, it's good to see the kids, you know, enjoy themselves like that. Okay, what we gotta do, fellas, uh, we gotta, once garbage is empty, and we gotta get the flag up, somebody wanna put it up? Robert, you want, who's good at putting up the flag? Anybody, volunteers, you can do it? I have kids always looking for work and looking for jobs, and it's not easy for 14, 15 year olds to, uh, to find work. They've been asking me for 10 years, hey coach, can you hook us up with a job? And they don't hire 14, 15 year olds, so, what I do every year is I hire kids from my basketball team or from just kids that I know from the community who are good kids, who, are, who I know need the money. Right now I have three kids working for me every Saturday and I usually end up buying them lunch. They help me out, you know, lining baseball fields and uh, mopping the floor before the, before the basketball game. I uh, pay them each 15, 20, whatever, whatever, how hard I think they work. The joke of it is, I always tell people, I, I probably would make more money if I stayed home, if I called in sick. Well, I'm not too, uh, too uh, anxious to boast because um, I, um, I came from a, 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 poor, a poor family too. Um, you know, I'm, still, I'm still trying to survive and, and, and make it, but um, I know that sometimes I look at a kid and I know I got a little bit more than him or my brother gets more than him or my other little brother we getting a little bit more than him, and I'll be like, you know, I think I can help that family out. Right now, that's what I'm doing. I'm helping, like, two kids on my team that I know that can't afford the, the, the price that we pay. And ladies and gentlemen, it's always an honor. I've been here about 20 years myself. It's always an honor and a privilege to introduce a veteran coach. Been here about 15 years. He's given a lot of his time, a lot of money, spends his free time here helping, volunteering. The one and only, ladies and gentlemen, Gerard. If the city had to pay out the man hours that volunteers put in, the city would definitely be in a deficit because uh, the city uh, just doesn't have the funds for all these type of jobs like coaches and, and uh, assistant preschool teachers, you know, an art teacher here or there. Um, and uh, it's, it's important that um, people recognize the fact that volunteers make the program run. The part-timers put a, a large amount of um, substance to the program also, but you know, without volunteers, it'd be impossible. He started playing here as a kid, you know, whatever. Now, now he's not only you know, playing here because he's too old, he plays at the high school, but now he's coaching uh, two teams. He's coaching what, ten, what age? Minors and juniors. It, with minors is like 10-year-olds and juniors is like 15-year-olds. So it's full circle. You say, what is the value of this park? You have a kid that, that used to play here, and now he's too old. He's playing high school ball, so now, it goes in a, now he's giving back to the, to the community by being a volunteer coach. Co imagine coaching two teams.
clientele is a gardener caretaker. Um, for the most part, we have a, um, a threefold um, goal here, which is, like I said, clean, green, and curb appeal. We try to keep the grass as green as we can, as clean as we possibly can, all the debris off the grounds, and all around the curves. We try to keep all the curves clean, anything around the park, in the vicinity of the park because things that are near the park will eventually end up on the ground. So we try to, if you see the, the curbs are clean, you will automatically assume that the rest of the park is clean because that's the part many people don't take care of, the curb. The toughest part is uh, keeping up with the vandalism, uh, graffiti, people using the restrooms in different areas, uh, corners uh, of, of the buildings, of, of the infrastructure. Everything else I can deal with pretty good, but I, I hate to see the vandalism. I found guns and knives in bushes, under equipment, hidden in different areas, in needles, uh, uh, crack pipes, um, um, marijuana pipes, things like that. And you see a lot of them smoking it, too. Those are about the strangest things I've found. And I haven't um, found any dead bodies yet, but <laughs> I'm hoping I don't. <laughs>
at the edges of the park at night, you can't see into the park. So it's kind of very eerie and kind of, you don't know what's in there. Like one time I thought I saw a werewolf, but it was just a man <laughs> with a fur coat. Uh, it's unbelievable at night. I mean, anything you can name. Yeah, if you name it, they claim it. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things going here and I see evidence when I get here in the mornings. You know, even in front of my door right there, there's, uh, I mean, they defecate, they urinate, and everything like that. So, it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's really tough at night. So, I was here, and um, I was leaving. I was locking up. So, when I went out through the side door, I, I heard some noise, but I was not sure if I heard what I thought I heard. And I was like, damn, I said... That sound like a lady. That's, that sound like some moaning. I said, nah. I said, nah. You know, I'm hearing things. So as I started walking away, I heard it again. It was real clear this time. And I was like, oh, I, okay. I know what I heard. That was that was that was moaning. Somebody's doing something over here. So instead of me walking straight towards the action, I went around the whole damn building. You know, went through the park, through the little swings, and there in the on on the steps. We have some steps on the back of the door. On the steps, there was a guy, and there's lady. The guy was the guy was sitting down like normal. And I, first, when I came around the corner, I didn't see the lady because I couldn't see her. I just seen him. He was just sitting there, relaxed. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, where? Okay, if he's sitting there, where's the noise coming from? You know. And then I heard the noise, and I said, Oh wow, man. Maybe I'll just move to the park. I don't know. He's so, he's he, <laughs> he really wants to live here, like seriously. Because there's people like will park on the side and they'll they'll live in campers <laughs> and stuff, and they'll live here for like months. Yeah. So they live right in their cars, and I was thinking, you know, that's not a bad idea. You don't have to pay rent and <laughs> nice scenery. Uh, I used to live out here by myself for, for years. Oh, really? Yep. And I see a lot of things change. I see a lot of friends of mine die here in this part. OD and stuff, you know. When you're homeless, you stay one place during the day and you try to find some place safe to sleep at night. I used to be homeless for about Four or five years, I parked my car down the street there. I used to live in my car. I've seen a number of them, and I know quite a lot of them. Uh, they're very, very nice people. Some of them, the homeless situation has pushed them completely over the edge. Some drink, some don't. Some do drugs, some don't. But there's every kind. I've been in this neighborhood for 14 years. Ain't nothing changed except people dying. The park is more, way better than before. And there are characters, like I said before, some have a few too many people in their world. They talk to all these people that we can't see them, but they're there. I got another, another chance to stop doing the same thing I used to do. You know, because I, I'm not better than them. You know, I used to be on the drug myself. There's only one life to live. It's way better than before. I see you you have a lot of friends here with you, a lot of uh, furry friends. Oh, my kitties, yes. Well, they've been my life. 
His name is Cotton. He was abandoned in a hotel room. The orange and white one over there, he was left out in the street in front of the building. So, good old mommy here takes him in. Boots came from an ab abusive home. He lived, ate, and did everything in his cat box. In there, I have a wild one. Somebody had nailed her in under the building. I tried the thing off and tamed her, and now here we are out on the street. But anyway. The lady that, um, who has the cats and, and has the, is living with her shopping carts and stuff, and she's a really great person. And the other day, I, she asked me if I could watch her carts for her for a little bit, which I did gladly because I think she's a great lady. And when, when, I, when she came back, you know, she said, um, thank you very much, and if there's anything I can do for you ever, please let me <laughs> do it. And, I, <laughs> and it's just, you know, here's somebody who's so down on their luck, and, you know, they offered to help me. And so I felt really touched by that because it was really nice. This park is beautiful. It's a nice park, and and... I'm just glad it's here for me to sit in. I used to come to this picnic table here and I would you know either write some lyrics or draw um, just different stuff I like to do and I guess at the same time she had been coming to the same bench and I didn't you know I, I had no idea until this one day I was sitting here working on my stuff and um, and I had seen her walk by but um, then she approached me and she's all like you're stealing my bench you have to stop and and it just went from there. We do have the story of the evil soccer players. We were, uh, we were playing over there. And we'd obviously been there about an hour. You know, we had five guys throwing the frisbee. Pretty intense game. And they just come up and set up the, uh, the, the goalie nets. And then set up the other one. And start kicking the ball around like just we because, were. Yeah, they'd been doing it for years. So. Yeah, well, we, we talked to them. Yeah. Nice, nice and civil, you know. Uh, and, uh, and they said, oh, well, we've been here for ten years. You guys have to leave. So... So we almost had a, a little turf battle. So this is how it really happened. <laughs> I came every day to the park to no, the bench. No, I came every day. I came and I would sit here and I started coming. One day I even came with my little cousin and we le left for like five minutes and the boy was sitting here. The boy, okay? I was just known as the boy. And so anyway, I was like, look cousin, that boy stole our bench. What a jerk. And so then um, I was leaving and I almost ran over him. But then I was like, oh, it's that boy that stole our bench. Isn't that weird? And I was like, do you think I'll ever see him again? No. That's what my cousin said. He was like, no. But then I came back and like he was sitting on my bench again. And I was pretty pissed. And then I came back again and he was sitting on my bench. So I was like, no, I've had it. So <laughs> I, I came to the bench and I was like, listen, you're going to have to share the bench with me, okay? Because I need it. And he says... Okay, and you know, I just sat down and we started talking. I said okay. Yeah, like he was like oh, okay. He was like okay. He yeah, came and I sat so. sat down with me, and uh, he moved to my side of the bench, and I thought he was kind of weird, but now we're <laughs> best friends, like super best friends. I think that we'll be best friends forever, thanks to the bench. Mm -hmm. I mean the park. <laughs> The mom, my most memory is like trying to get Barry out of the park because she, she like lays down every day. I mean, if I try to pull her out, she pancakes out on the thing. In fact, I have a name. They call me the Straddler because she never wants to come out of the park, so I have to drag her between my legs, you know, through the park. So, so the local lore named me the Straddler from the local pe guys that stay here in the park. The first time I ever got really, uh, the first time I ever had a taste of alcohol <laughs> was at a, 
who was at a, about 14 years old. And that was a group of guys who decided to come. MD 2020, heard of it? Boone's Farm. Yeah, he's going to have the head, the Boone guy's going, yeah, Boone's Farm. Um, yeah, we finished off a couple bottles. <clears throat> Just drinking. I remember I hated the taste. It was disgusting. Next thing you know, we're sitting there, you know, can't even walk out of the park. I remember when I, by the time I got home, I snuck into the house. Somehow I got in. I laid down on the bed. I remember the, the, and I said, I'll never drink again. Boy, was I wrong. There was the flock of parakeets. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was the... <laughs> There's a tree full well, of Well, there was a tree full of parakeets, and so we tried to we catch them. This, and well, we heard this really <laughs> weird sound. We're like, what is that? We followed it, and it was the tree filled with parakeets. Yeah, we thought they escaped from, from a, a... Pet shop. <laughs> pet shop. <laughs> pet shop escaping. Yeah, it had to have been at least 100 parakeets. <laughs> oh, my God. It was. was like, what yeah, do they was sound nice. like? Just kind of like... A pet shop. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time I was with my dad and my brother, and we were running like crazy. We were just, you know, I was I was in the lead, you know, and I was running, and I I jumped over a little hedge onto what I thought was more grass. It was a lily pad in 18 inches of water. <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm face down in 18 inches of water. So anyway, that was that was a uh, that was a terrific experience. I found a car badge that was from the Premier Motor Car Company. I wasn't sure what it was. It just looked like a piece of metal covered in dirt. I actually thought it was a sprinkler head digging it up, but uh, because I couldn't identify it immediately, I, I stuck it in my bag, took it home, washed it up, actually listed it on the Treasure Depot on the internet and found out that it was a uh, car badge from the Premier Motor Car Company from the early 1900s. Uh, don't know exactly how old, but probably somewhere between 1903 and 1914. Sold it on eBay for almost $200. I guess it was very valuable to somebody. So that was quite interesting. We didn't see each other for a while and he like itched my name in the bench and um, then he like put a little marking for every day he didn't see me. So I thought that was really, 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 really cute. At first I thought it was kind of psychopathic. But then I realized how thoughtful and amazing it was. Yeah. Best friend. I'm not a psychopath. I know. There was a, a case one time where um, there was a gang member who got beat up in the park, and uh, they ran him out of the park, and about an hour later, another gang, the gang came back. The other gangsters were out around one of the outside restrooms, one of the field restrooms, and um, so this gang came up. I was outside working, and I was somewhere right between where the two uh, encountered each other, and shots rang out, and I hit the hit the ground right, face down and uh so the other the, when the other gang took off the gang that was in the park uh, took off running after these guys and they ran right by me and i was i thought sure they might try to do something to me but they didn't do anything to me they just ran right by me and was running behind this other gang we had the center and it was a, a poor area. Some staff members said baseball won't work here. And I just like couldn't believe they would say that. So we tried baseball, we had tryouts, we had a clinic. A good way to start a program is to have a free clinic, get kids interested in it, give some prizes away, and then try and start a league. So we did that, we had a clinic, and then so we had tryouts. And we had about 200 kids for tryouts. So I was like, wait a second, I thought you said there was no kids. The trouble is they had like four gloves between the 200 kids. And it was like, I can't believe these don't have a glove. You know, I thought, thought everybody was born with one. So, um, so what happens is we hooked up with the major league uh, team and got some low price tickets for glove night, which was happened to be early in the season that year. And we took a couple buses of kids and they got our glove. The trouble is, some of the kids wanted to sell the gloves for money right away. I said, no, you need this for the season. Don't sell the gloves.
During the summer program, we have a lot of kids in the park. We have lunch programs and different uh, activities going on like that. The kids were having lunch one day and uh, a gang came up and saw this other gang outside. Uh, this gang was about probably, I would say, maybe 50 yards from where the kids were eating and they start firing. And bullets just hitting the buildings and hitting the cement and ricocheting everywhere and kids hit the, hit the deck. So the next year, what they did during the uh, uh, summer camp program, they let the kids eat inside the gym. And that way they would have a little bit more protection in case there, there was some shooting. We'd have to go to like the library or something, and that's boring. Yeah. And I don't think they let you. I mean, and like I, sometimes I like to play my music and stuff at the park, and by punk rock. And then I don't think they <laughs> let you do that at the library. No. 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 Yeah. So I'd probably die without the park. If the park wasn't here, I'd probably go insane. I have a lot of concrete in my neighborhood. It's not too pretty. So I think I don't know. I think I'd be m more stressful. More stressed out then, yeah, if I didn't have the park. I would have to drive and find one somewhere. Because <laughs> that's the whole focus is, you know, I got to keep my dogs happy. If they're happy, then I am. this park closed, you know, you'd have to ask yourself, where would these two or three hundred kids go? What would they do? They'd be out probably right now robbing your car or breaking into your home or my home. I can tell you what I'd be doing uh, if the park wasn't been here. If Mark would have been here, I'd probably be in my friend's house, partying. Being at the movies, <coughs> watching, getting, getting in trouble, breaking curfew. I would say a, a lot of them will be in jail, a lot of them will be locked up. Uh, over the years, I don't see a whole bunch of kids that, that came in the center, the rec center, and they, it improved their lives. Yeah, so I, is it in the back? Yeah, it's in the back. You put it away last week, remember? Who's calling him, Dave? Yeah, I wouldn't be the same person I am now. I'd be out in the street causing problems. I'd be probably most likely in a gang by now and just causing trouble outside. I'd probably been incarcerated by now or something, but I wouldn't be here now. Everybody remembers Gilbert Arenas, who now plays for the, uh, the Washington Wizards. He started off here at our park. Uh, he went down the street to the high school, and then he got picked up by a good university, which was Arizona. Played his two seasons there. Then he made the draft, ended up with the Golden State Warriors. Michael Jordan picked up, took him off that team, and now he's with the Washington Wizards. And I, and I remember him, because I remember him, I can remember him from day one when he first was here, when he always used to get on the court, and we used to tell him, like, get off the court, get off the court, it's not your turn, it's not your turn, stay off the court, Gilbert, stay off the court. And now the fool's making millions. <laughs> This park, you know, this park uh, and, and all parks in, in the United States, I think, serve as, as uh, one of the greatest resources for kids, a real positive, wholesome at, uh, atmosphere where they can come and, and, and recreate. It makes a difference in that 
open space. Maybe you come to a park as passive recreation, just sitting around, laying on the grass, just enjoying the scenery, or if you come for active recreation, a sports or a playground for children, it just makes you feel better. It's uh, self-gratifying and it's, uh, it's always a pleasure. The rec center makes a big difference because uh, when I was growing up, um, I didn't, we didn't have a rec center when, where I live, where I used to live at. It, uh, it was a big parking lot. <laughs> And we used to um, throw the ball in the parking lot, and it was, it was surrounded with a big fence. So we used to hop over the fence and play ball inside the fence. And uh, as I, like I said, when I got older and when we moved over here, I noticed the, the center, and I was like, what is this? And I was like, wow, man, they got stuff for little kids, that little kids can stay out of trouble, blah, blah, blah. I can come here whenever I need help. I mean, the staff here is very generous. They, if I can just come and speak to any of them, because... They know how I, like how I feel. They know what it's about out there, and I can just come in and speak to any of them, and they'll all help me out in situations like that. I mean, we're like an all big family here. Everybody helps everybody out. Nobody has hate for anybody here. Everybody loves each other. The main part that I get about being a volunteer coach. When I, when I know I've done a good job, when the parents are all happy and they're congratulating me outside and I don't see no frowns on nobody's face. and it, It's cool. I like it. I love it, actually. You know, the bottom line is, why do I do it? Because it makes me feel good, giving something back to the community. To me, that's what real coaching is. It doesn't seem like it, but it's had a major impact. It's all the little things that they've done for me, for myself, and the rest of the kids that come here. It's had a major impact. I don't come from a lot. So everything that I get from here, I cherish it, like, a lot. I drive a lot of these kids home and I see the streets they live on. And believe me, <laughs> when I drive down the street, I'm sometimes ducking down. I want to make sure that I don't, I don't dare look either way. Uh, and I think, how in the world do these kids live, grow up? You know, how, how could they not be uh, uh, pessimistic about their future? But when they show up in this gym, uh, there's at least this, there's a little ray of sunshine. There's a little ray of hope. And, and I see it. The park had been in um, disrepair, uh, uh, not cleaned, uh, unkept for several years. And my supervisor said, um, there's a park that uh, nobody wants. Nobody want to go there. Everybody's afraid to go there. And she said, uh, uh, would you be willing to go and, and try to make a difference? And I said, yes, I'm here to do a job. You know, and they said, well, it's a lot of gangs there, and you may get shot. I said, well, I just have to take their chance. So I went, and uh, never had been there before. When I got there, I couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, there was a stench around the place. I mean, there were windows broken. There was vandalism. There was every inch of the building was vandalized. Uh, when I looked at it, I said, you know, I, it's going to take a while to turn this thing around. And I said, I don't know if I ever will. But I requested uh, a crew. To, to help me uh, turn this thing around. The first crew I uh, requested that came in to help, they just gave up. I mean, they, when they saw it, they just got to say, oh no, I just, we just can't do it. 
You know, it, it'll never happen. You'll never make it. You, you never turn around. I said, no, we're going to turn this place around. So I, I requested another crew. Um, so I got a crew on that. The second request, I got a crew that was really dedicated, that uh, really wanted to help me do turn this thing around. So we got busy, we rolled up our sleeves, we, we scraped grime and grease. Uh, we just went through everything that we saw that was dilapidated or need repair or need replacing. And we just changed everything. And um, once they start seeing the park uh, start shaping up and people start coming by and giving us a little praise and giving us a, 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 a accolades about how they liked the park and how things were changing, the neighborhood began to change. Around the neighborhood where all the homes were, people start to cutting the grass, people start to paint the fences, they start taking all these old cars that weren't running out of the yard, they start doing all the things that would make the house, a home look good. So the park was a reflection of the neighborhood. As the park changed, the neighborhood changed. And it was just a total transformation. The whole park became that little haven in the middle of the neighborhood. All because of you. Yeah, well, I hope so. I hope so because, I mean, I, I just took it under my wing that I was going to change this thing. It was an opportunity for me to make a difference in, 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 in the world. Maybe I may not make another difference anywhere else. But like I say, it's a labor of love, and I don't mind doing it because when I leave in the afternoons, I want this park to be sparkling because this park is representative of who I am. The park made a tremendous difference in my life because that's where I met my best friend and he is the most important thing in my life. Since I moved here, like he's the most important person to me. That's all because of the park. Life in the city can be kind of isolated. You know, you sit in traffic by yourself. Um, unless you're lucky enough to carpool with someone. But to come here and see people playing soccer, you know, and see people uh, out here just kind of reading books, things like that, I feel very connected to the community. So you kind of get to know some of the people in the neighborhood that, you know, in a normal city environment, you don't get that chance. So people are a little more friendly over here. To knowing that there's, that people can, can be together in a situation like this and, and be around each other without having any problems, you know, without, and, and sharing with each other. It's a break from the city. You're not just sitting there staring at four walls or concrete and steel all the time, that you actually have a place of green and trees that you can go and it actually just kind of makes you unwind. It's so easy, you know? Cheap. And nice. <laughs> and good for life. Well, you know, the old poem, the old poem, you know, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. This is not exactly true, but it, it seems when I walk on the grass and, and with Shelby, and I, I walk for anywhere from, if, if it's a short walk, 15 minutes, if it's a long walk, uh, two hours, you know, because she's stopping to smell everything and uh, and I talk to people and I um, I just have a good time in the park there he is right here pool tab that's what I figured it was a piece of trash but always worth looking as gold usually registers as trash so if you don't have the trash you'll miss the gold As I left the park, I felt content that I had accomplished what it was I had set out to do. I met some very nice people, and I gained a better understanding. An understanding about what the park really means to these people, and the enormous positive effect it can have on a community here in the big city. 
that it really does make a difference. Life seems a little better with the park in it. <laughs>